Manx Made, supported by IOMFoodandDrink.com. Hello and welcome to Manx Made, a new three-part island life series with me, Michelle James. We'll be uncovering some of the island's most exciting food and drink products, from salt to rum to ice cream. Let's go behind the scenes and find out exactly what goes into making these Manx made products. On tonight's episode, we discover the process behind making two of my favourite foods ice cream and chocolate. Oh, yes. I wanted to learn how one might go about learning how to make these sweet treats. Ian and Greg Davison have been making ice cream and chocolate on the Isle of Man for many years, and so I gave them a visit. Before I had the chance to learn how to make ice cream, Ian told me what inspired him to make ice cream and chocolate his job. When I first got married, um, we bought a shop called The Chocolate Box, which had been in existence in Peel on the Market Square for ever. And we bought the shop, um, and it had been closed down for years. It was one of Gore's old rock shops, and it had been closed down a long time. And um, we decided that we could do something with it, bought the shop, and my wife uh, was nursing, and I opened up and I ran the shop. And we were buying in chocolates, and we were selling everybody else's um, and at that time, all the old sweet companies were going, you know, Barker and Dobson and Cabris, and they were all the old traditional sweets. And um, so we sold all of those. We had 22 different sorts of chocolate eclairs at that time. Um, so we opened up the shop, and we were doing really well. But the chocolates and things we sold, we thought, well, maybe we can make these ourselves. So we decided that I would go then into the production side um, with chocolates. So we converted the backyard of the shop put a window in so people could actually see us working and um, put the machinery out there and started to try and learn our own chocolate. So rather than try and learn and the learning curve that's involved with that, um, I actually went to a company called Gulliver's in, in London. Um, a guy called Peter Stern ran this company. And I worked with them for a couple of weeks just to learn the, the job. And then the company I was dealing with for the chocolate was called Calabau. And they were in, um, in Belgium, in a, comp- in a place called Wies in Belgium. And I went there and I spent a month um, at their academy to learn chocolate making, to try and take away the learning curve and so we could produce something straight away that we could sell. Um, and it really, it's sort of built from there. So that would have been oh God, 88-ish. Um, so we've been going for a long time. I learned the trade as a chocolatier rather than an ice cream producer. Now, at the time when we were making chocolates, we, after a few years, we, we were looking at the big companies like Mars and Cadbury's and these people, and, um, and they were all going into ice cream. And one of the things we always had, or I always had it in my mind, I've never had a business plan. I've never written anything down. I've always sort of had it in my head. And I've always... Knowing the way that a direction that I'd like to go at some stage with the different things in business, and one of the things we wanted to do because chocolate has um, it peaks at certain times of the year, so Christmas, Valentine's, Mother's Day, um, but in the summertime, chocolate troughs. In other words, it, the sales drop um, because nobody really wants chocolate in the summertime. So all the big companies were in exactly the same boat, and at that time they were all starting to go into the ice cream business. So Cadbury's, Mars, uh, they were all bringing out their own. Um, ice cream lines and we thought well maybe we could do the same so we decided then 1995 to venture into some form uh, of ice cream production now we set up against the traditional Manx company Manx Ices um, which had been operated here ruthlessly I would have thought over the years and it was it was a really good company um, and we dealt with them and it had changed hands a couple of times from the original owners, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kelly, who started the business. We were not getting the best of services. Um, and we, th- we thought, well, there's, there's room there for somebody to come in and to set up. Uh, and that was 
where we really thought, well, we'll set up an ice cream business. So rather than going back down the learning curve of trying to wonder, well, how do we do this and how do we do that? We bought some small machinery, but enough to probably supply six or seven different shops at the most. We bought a small freezer so that the, the initial ice cream machinery came from um, a company in Scotland called Adonis. And then we flew in um, another man called Carlo Capaldi. Uh, and Carlo was working for a company called Mucci, who were the flavor house. And they made all the fruit flavors, strawberry, raspberry, and all these different things. So we flew in the machinery manufacturer and we flew in the flavor house to the island along with the machinery. And we set up in the ice cream business. And that eliminated quite a lot of the, the learning curve. And we had a basic recipe at that time. And then our recipe developed. And the, really the recipe that we ended up with was a traditional recipe from the Isle of Man um, from a company that was here. And it was Fleece's ice cream. And Fleece's ice cream had been going for donkey's years. It had been set up during the wartime by Dominic Fleece. And we basically had Dominic's recipe. And we still have uh, and it was a traditional ice cream made with milk, made with double cream, all the best of ingredients really, Tate and Lyle sugar. And, and that's exactly how we make it to this day. Um, so we haven't really hacked about with that, that recipe at all. It's, um, and it's stood as well. I mean, it's very nice, it's very tasty. Your traditional vanilla flavor. All of the flavors that we produce all come from a base mix. And the base mix is what it's it's um it's just a creamy mix that we produce using obviously Isle of Man cream, Isle of Man milk, Tate and Lyle sugar, uh, and all those ingredients would be mixed in. Now ice cream, but people may not know because it's it's an iced iced cream. Um, they may not know it's actually boiled process. So ice cream mix is actually boiled. So all those ingredients we have fairly large machinery he here now, which obviously we didn't have initially, but. It's a boil process and all the ingredients are putting at different temperatures and then they're allowed to boil and we leave them boil for about an hour, hour and a half. And that allows everything to mix together. And then it's all pumped back out of the tanks as quickly as we can get it. And it's pumped through an homogenization. Nowadays, it's pumped through an homogenization system and the plate cooling system. And it comes from 82, 83 degrees in three or four seconds down to plus two, three degrees and then put straight into the storage tanks. Something you mentioned was the fact that your ice cream is, at the core of it, is Manx ingredients. Has that always been the case? Yeah, it has. Um, one of the things we always wanted to do was to have all local ingredients. Now, when we set up in business, there was actually an unwritten law here, and that law was challenged um, through the courts here on the Isle of Man by Manx ices going back a long, long time ago. Um, and I think somewhere along the line, it possibly cost the business um, challenging the government over this. Now, the government had like an unwritten law. So when we set up in ice cream production, a litre had to weigh 550 grams. There was a minimum fat content of 10%. Um, those regulations have now gone because they were taken away. However, they were there when we set up. So our recipe is exactly the same. The time scale from, from literally a cow being milked to it being made into ice cream is, is so short. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I, sp <laughs> I suppose nowadays it's important that you don't have all these, these miles where you're traveling stuff back and forward. But I suppose we get fresh cream daily from the creamery and that'll be milk from the probably tankered in the previous day. Um, it's gone through all their homogenization process. It's gone through their skimming process where they take all the cream off because cream really is a, was, I suppose, a byproduct. But nowadays it's a, a sought after commodity because they use it for making their butter. It's a highly prized, whereas at one time they would chuck it on the land and use it as a fertilizer. It's now highly prized because cream now fetches uh, quite a high price. Going back to the, the real beginnings of it, but what was the real drive and the excitement around chocolates and then later ice cream? Is it a sweet tooth of yourself or <laughs> is it just the pure joy of it? I don't know. I reckon if I'd done better at school, I might not have had to work for myself. <laughs> I might not have had to work for myself, but I don't know. Um, I was never the best at school, unfortunately. Um, and I sort of had to work for a living, so... I suppose a sweet tooth, I don't know. It was just something that was there at that particular time and I fancied to do it. And we could see there was a potential with the chocolate box because it had closed down, but it's always been a really good shop. And then when we bought it, 
um, I went back to the previous owner, a man called Tony Carser. And Tony helped me no end with all of the people he used to buy from, like Matty and Tiso in Southport and all of the contacts he had for all of the old fashioned suites. We used, we picked Tony's brains and, and, and we got in touch with all those people and we then took that shop up to the next level. I mean, it would be packed at Christmas time with, with um, different, all the lovely big boxes of chocolates and all the nice decorations. And we sold lots of stuff in there. Your ice cream has been tried by probably the majority of people on this island, but it's actually had much more of a journey across, across the world than just staying on the island, hasn't it? There's some quite exciting stories. TT, when we have our vans at the grandstand, um, and, and even our shops on, on Pure Promenade, we, we had more shops at one time, which we don't have any more, but we supply a lot of places. But um, the customers, our customers are from all over the world. Um, and the amount of times we hear it's the best ice cream they've ever tried. And we actually, a few years ago, we, we picked up a customer here on the Isle of Man, which is the ultimate ruler of Dubai. And we have sold ice cream to them probably for the last eight or nine years eight years <laughs> and on occasion we've had to ship ice cream to Dubai which took us a long time to work out exactly the best way to get it there um, but now we've got it off to an art we can now ship ice cream from an initial order within we can have it in Dubai in three days the reason why your ice cream is so st strongly ingrained in my mind is because ever since I, ever since I can remember, my dad is as you know big fan of the vanilla old-fashioned ice cream and and will not have any other ice cream in the world and I'm sure he's not the only one no I mean we have loads of people I mean as I say going back to the TT people come off the boat and come to the grandstand to get an <laughs> ice cream before they go to the hotels it's strange I mean we see the same faces every year and there's thousands of people it, it's if you mention the Isle of Man to them they automatically say oh god Davison's ice cream we need to go and get one of them you know and it's nice that we've built um, a brand that people one, but we've built that brand on using the best in quality ingredients. We, we've never cheapened that ingredient. We've increased the price, but we've never gone down the route of cheapening the product in order to make money. And that must make you feel pretty proud when, when you're getting customers' feedback like that. Well, we could swap. I mean, we could instantly swap over and not use any local ingredients at all. And we could use everything from England. Um, and we could change the way we, we manufacture ice cream, but it would take away, it just would not be the same. We could never get that. That unique flavor is because we use Isle of Man products. You're listening to Manx Made with me, Michelle James, a new series where I go behind the scenes to learn about the process of making some of the island's most exciting food and drink products. This week, I'm talking to Ian and Greg Davison from Davison's Ice Cream. Next up, I spoke to Greg, Ian's son, who makes all the ice cream in the factory. So the cows are milked, the delivery of cream arrives, and then what? So the delivery comes in, goes obviously into storage, um, unless I'm making it on that day. Um, they all come through our main shutter door into the main production area. Um, they then go into what basically is a big radiator, so it's a big stainless steel tank. It holds 12 liter, uh, 1,200 litres of uh, raw base mix, um, and then it's got a thermal jacket around the outside which heats up. Uh, we take it to above 72 degrees, which is pasteurisation, so I usually take it to about 82 degrees um, and then leave it there for an hour. For us, it, it doesn't do anything extra to the product, but it's just that little bit of safety for me because I like to know that everything that could be potentially harmful within the product is gone. I mean, it seems ridiculous that you're heating, you're making ice cream and you're heating it up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but when we, when, so because we make everything from basic raw ingredients, um, in order to dissolve the sugar and bits like that, we have to take it and we have to heat it up. Um, it dissolves into the ice cream properly. Because we're using double cream, we need the fat particles within the cream to melt. Um, to combine with everything else so that's the whole idea of doing it um, but also for pasteurization so pasteurization is basically killing any of the harmful bacteria that might be in um, any of the product luckily um, 
the Manx law on the island says that everything coming into us has to be pasteurised anyway, so we're technically double pasteurising it um, just to be on the safe side. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, 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 it's basically to make sure all the ingredients are combined together. So the stabilisers that we use have to be um, put into hot liquid in order for them to, to bind. And th- this this is the the tank that we're looking at now. Yeah, yeah. So we've got two two 1,200 litre tanks. Um, during the summer months, I run on both, but in the winter months, I tend to just use one, um, and then I'll just alternate between the two, so they're not getting the, they're getting equal wear and tear throughout the winter months. Um, so basically, they are a big hopper. So there's a lid on the top. We lift the lid up, um, and all of the ingredients go onto the inside. Um, within the inside of the tank, there's an agitator which basically mixes all the ingredients up together um, and equally distributes the heat throughout it so that you don't end up with hot spots or burning on the ice cream uh, mix when it's being produced. Um, And basically, that's all that tank does. It just heats up and mixes everything together. And so are you pouring it all in by hand there? Unfortunately, yes. A lot of people don't realise that it is quite a physical job. So when I'm boiling on a daily basis, I could be lifting five to six tonne of ingredients into the tanks. Um, so I get home and then when my wife goes, oh, just take the kids for me. And I'm thinking, oh, I've just lifted five tonne of ingredients today. I just want to sit down. Um, but obviously, I, I love being a father, so I just get on with it. <laughs> but yeah, everything is lifted by hand. Um, and it's one of the drawbacks, really, because at a certain time, like my dad's struggling now, um, I'm going to get to the same point as him. So we are looking at different ways in which I can do it so that I'm not wearing myself out over the next 10 to 15 years. So... And so where do we go now? So how that's been in there for, what, uh, so, an hour or so? So, yeah, we would leave it in there for an hour or so, uh, depending on what it is. Um, salt and caramel, we use the same base mix, but we do it slightly differently because we don't use the flavouring in our salt and caramel. Um, but I won't go into that process because it's a secret. It was something that we stumbled across accidentally um, <laughs> one day when we were doing something, and it's the process that I've used for salt and caramel ever since we started making it. Um, the only flavouring that goes into it is the salt, which we use proper sea salt in. But yeah, once, once it's been in the tanks for an hour, um, we then open up basically a tap on the front of the tank. It then flows through some stainless steel pipes um, through a pumping system, and it goes into what's called an homogenizer. Um, so an homogenizer basically breaks down the fat particles within the ice cream because we're using double cream you need the fat particles to be small enough that when so that they basically combine with every other ingredient in there otherwise when we pump them into our storage tanks um, the fat particles separate so it'd be like tipping fat into water and you get the two separating from each other Um, so what homogenization does is it puts the mix under pressure breaks the fat particles down and makes everything combined together so that it's the same quality throughout that means that when I pump it into the storage tanks, the minute I connect up to the bottom to pump it in to make ice cream, the mix at the bottom is the same as the mix at the top. There is no deviation in quality between it, or you've got no separation in any ingredients. And every, every single flavour is done, done separately, and you put all the flavourings into here? No. Oh, I've made an error. <laughs> <laughs> the only ones, so salted caramel is done separately in the tank and chocolate. Other than that, everything else is flavoured in our storage tanks mm-hmm. because everything else can be added in cold. So for things uh-huh. like strawberry, because we use a fruit pulp flavouring, um, that will combine in when the mix is cold. Chocolate is slightly different because we use proper chocolate. So if I add chocolate into cold mix, it obviously doesn't melt. So I need it to be hot in order for it to melt down. So in a 300 litre tank, we're using about 25 kilo of dark chocolate um, when we're doing it. So there's quite a lot of chocolate in our chocolate <laughs> ice cream. Um, That's my favourite by far. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have a favourite. I'm sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with it all my life, so the last thing I want to do is eat ice cream, I'm afraid. <laughs> so once it's gone in the storage tanks, how do, does it then get to the next stage? How does it get on my cone? Um, it basically goes through what is a big whipping machine. Um, so we have a thing called a continuous freezer. The continuous freezer that we have produces 1,200 litres of ice cream an hour. Um, what we do is it's a pumped system so we connect up to the bottom of our storage tanks um, and it it basically pumps the mix from the storage tanks up through the back of the machine Um, it then whisks like a whipping machine would do um, basically freezes the ice cream down and then it pumps it back out through a fill nozzle Um, the filler nozzle is then filled by me by hand which a lot of people don't realize because they go it's all machinery no everything's filled by hand Um, even the inclusions added in because 
people moan at me sometimes when they get a rum and raisin from ShopRite and they go, oh, there's only one raisin in the bottom of my uh, in the bottom of my tub. But when you fill on a one liter in three seconds, it's quite hard to get the raisins in quick enough. So um, <laughs> we are looking at a new system this next year whereby the raisins will be put in separately and not through, well, not basically with a jug by myself. So it hopefully will put more consistency throughout the whole ice cream. So you get the same amount of raisins from the start to the finish. And so forever improving and trying to kind of make the products as best as you possibly can make them. Yeah, we, we always, I, I like criticism. I like people to come to me and say, I've got an issue with this or I didn't like this. And that way I can improve it or I can tweak it to try and make it better. So when people are moaning at me that the consistency of the raisins isn't the same from top to bottom, I'm looking at ways in which I can improve that because we've always based ourselves on the quality of the product. And if the quality is not there, people just won't buy it so if i can keep the, co- the quality the same throughout the whole process and there's there's easier ways to do it um, that's what i look for and i know you're a man who likes to continually make new flavors and this is something that's ha- been happening for a long time yeah. recently the the ukraine uh, ice cream was really really popular yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah so my dad's wife's ukrainian um and when the Ukraine situation came about she asked whether there was anything I could do in order to do like a fundraising event for them so that we could get basically she wanted to buy medical supplies to go out um, and food for anybody that's stuck out in Ukraine because all her family are out there Um, so she just wanted to basically look after the communities that were being affected the most Um, so I came up with a a double combination in ice cream for her Um, we sat down and worked out what flavors would go well together because some do, some don't. Um, even though they may be nice separately, they don't always combine well. Um, so yeah, and then I, I used our oldest piece of machinery, which is the very first machine that my dad bought, which is an Adoni batch freezer. Um, and I made the double combination on that. So it was a little bit time consuming, but it was worth it because we, we raised quite a good bit of money and the supplies that were needed got out there. So. And I know that you said you're sick of ice cream, but do do you have a favourite? If you if you had to pick an, I do. Yes. Um, although I'm I'm constantly telling people because we use the same mix for our whippy ice cream as we do for our normal ice cream, um, it's exactly the same. I like a whippy, um, and although I tell people that they the only difference is the temperature. It's that temperature that makes it better sometimes. So at the end of it, if I've been on a busy show on the ice cream vans, um, I like to have a whippy at the end of the day. Only to drive because your throat gets dry talking to people when you're asking them what they want and bits like that. So yeah, whippy's just just nice. It it makes everything, uh, I don't know, just gives you that bit of energy back at the end of the day. And very much so in keeping with the, the family essence of the business, your little ones are have taken a bit of a shine to, to ice cream. Yeah, yeah. Whether I would encourage them to come in or not, depending on what <laughs> happens in the in the future with regards to lifting and bits like that, because it is a lot of work. Um, the rewards you get out, because I, I I like people to be satisfied with what I'm making. So when people come to me and say, oh, I love that product or that was really nice, that's where I get my satisfaction from. Um, and whether they'll get the same satisfaction from it or not, I don't know. I'm trying to bring them up whereby well the same way I was brought up so I was brought up to work so that you never got anything unless you put anything in um, and that's the way I'm doing it so I bring them down and I've got them scraping the floors or moving ice cream with me even though they only three and six <laughs> but they, they still love it um, Jack my, my six year old who's at, at school at the minute he comes down after school and he'll be putting lids on the tops and bits like that and it's just that he's got that enthusiasm at the minute and I hope it carries on um, we'd love the family business to carry on into the future but you, you just don't know what's going on at the minute so yeah we'll wait and see that's all we've got time for on tonight's episode of manx made with me michelle james tune in at the same time next week where i'll be heading up north to meet ian and rick the duo behind outlier distilling company together we'll learn about the process of making rum and how to make a yummy cocktail or two see you then Manx Made, supported by IOMfoodanddrink.com. Add one locally grown or produced product to your basket when shopping. These small considerations can have a big cumulative community effect and support our food and drink producers.